not to say that John Lewis have cut any corners with their budgets, but the the way that they have been reinterpreting classic music and having it, you know, basically all re- reproduced in a, in a style that they kind of have made their own, um, that will be cheaper for them than just using the original track. They love a depressing acoustic version the day, of, a, yeah. of a popular the track, day, yeah. don't they? <laughs> Mark's trademark, you're going to hear it. I, I'm going to laugh at it every time now. You know once something's pointed out to you. <laughs> but Matthew, um, Mark's trademark of... Oh. 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 <laughs> I didn't realise I'd trademarked that uh, noise. You should. You should. You should, yeah. That's your audio ident uh-huh. in life. Okay, so welcome to uh, this new podcast that we're doing. Um, and It's got a name. We think it's got a name. It might cost us some money and royalties long term. <laughs> we don't know. We hope not. Um, well, it's, it's funny you say that because between the test edit of the first episode and the final edit, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it was there and I just didn't notice it. But we say it in the f- in the proper edit. You, see, I think you say it pretty much straight away. You're introducing us and we're saying, "Who are you?" And one of us says, "The third leg of this tripod." Ah. Mm. Mm. I think it was me. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think I said tripod. <laughs> the shenanigans. <laughs> no, I think, yeah, you said tripod, yeah. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah, that's right, yeah. No royalties. So there you go. You can have There's that the one evidence. <laughs> There's the evidence. I'll just dub in the other parts of it, okay? Yeah, so what's the uh, name of the podcast, Matthew? The tripod. Right. Ooh. This is something else for me to sort out as What? Well. You, you cynical bastard, just say it with some positivity. Yeah, but... Look at my face. <laughs> I've got a nice big smile. But just just because I said it that way, it doesn't mean I'm being negative about it. I'm mm. building it up, man. I'm building its part of mm. the tripod. And the tagline. It's going to sound good. And the, and the tagline. It's going to sound good. Behind the creative. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think <laughs> you're right. <laughs> yeah, so welcome to that anyway. Um, so in this one, what we're going to try and cover is how much does video production cost? Which is a question. Quite often, the first question we ever get asked. And by a simple budget. answer, which is, how much you got? <laughs> it kind of is, isn't it? <laughs> Spoilers! <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so we're going to break this down because it's a complex answer, isn't it? And it depends on quite a lot of factors. You ask us that question, we've got a lot of questions mm-hmm. to ask you back, yeah. basically, is, is, the, uh, is the point of this. So we're going to try and help you understand how we would then break down the costs from there so where do we start someone says yeah look I need a I need a video how much is it going to cost us because that's a that's a big factor of whether I'm going to go ahead with it or not whether I can see the return so in your very helpful LinkedIn post Matthew that you've that you've done mm-hmm. called how much does video production cost the first element that you talk about is brief what is your brief so tell me a bit about that to begin with. Um, well, there isn't obviously a simple answer to how much does a video cost. And you've got to start with what the intention of it is and that obviously is what the brief needs to communicate. Yes, the brief might uh, have certain specific points in it and say, well, we have to get this point across or it must be in this kind of style. You know, sometimes that happens. But ultimately the brief is like, we need to make a video of some kind for this purpose and then quite often even if someone does come to us with an idea of the type of video that they want that isn't necessarily a thing that we'll end up making because obviously the first thing we do is start asking them questions about why basically we, we interrogate what their thinking is so that we can figure out if they've if they've imagined the right thing for their audience and for their purpose or whether they need a bit of guidance on it which is fine because we expect that most people need a bit of guidance. That's part of why we're here. Mm-hmm. So the second part, Mark, is budget, which is literally us saying, "Well, do you have a budget in mind?" Well, because people can be quite funny about revealing yeah, that information. Yeah, it's always kind of like the elephant in the room, isn't it? But knowing the budget is kind of key because, yeah, it's blatantly if they tell us how much they've got or the wary of telling us how much they've got because we will in their mind spend it all and that's probably right because 
we want to make the best production we can for that money but it's also kind of the expectations of what they think they can have offset against what they've actually got to spend I think that's becoming a greater it, it's becoming further apart the expectations of all these things that are produced out there that they see all the time against what they've actually got to spend can sometimes not marry up so it is a, a brutal question to ask but I think it's one of the first ones that we generally do just to kind of get everything out on the table and say right well that's what you've got because it could limit the idea process and kind of like the the final production is it going to be animation have we got enough for animation is it 3d animation is it 2d animation even just looking at it quite quickly like that it's um something that i feel needs to be established earlier on in the process for everyone's benefit i was going to say it, <coughs> it protects everyone it protects them the client from wanting you know a huge production that they've never got the resources to, to make mm -hmm. and it protects us from sitting around dreaming stuff up that could be really good for them that they haven't got the resources to make and it just very quickly gets to the point where we can and quite often we surprise people with this it's it's always you know we want to make the most of what they've got we want to give them the best possible output from what they've got so a, a very obvious example of what I'm thinking about is um, when we did the Save Our Seafarers project many years ago we had a limited budget for the scope of what needed to be done we needed to travel do interviews we needed to figure out a way to and it was about you know the problem of Somali piracy <coughs> so we knew there was going to be interviews and talking heads and some graphics and facts and figures but we needed something that was going to engage people in it so they told us the budget and we went back to them and said well we're going to open the film by staging a reenactment dramatic reenactment of Somali pirate attack which happens obviously at sea on boats link in the description <laughs> and uh, the agency literally said to us no you're not you can't do it for that money and then we did it on your test board mm -hmm. so I suppose the flip side of that one as well is when we did <coughs> some uh, some animations for a local body and um, target audience was children and it, we felt it needed a specific style and delivery visually creatively and from a voiceover point of view as well and what they were trying to deliver they didn't have the budget or the budget they had in mind wasn't going to work wasn't going to be able to deliver it for for that amount of money so we, we we did the idea and said this is what we can create it'll hit your target audience it'll work but unfortunately it's at the moment it's unaffordable so they went they, they really liked the idea didn't they they, they really wanted it they really knew, could see the value of what we'd brought and why it was yeah. going to cost that amount and they managed to up the budget and they got was it three four videos this is covid junior champions uh -huh. There was, a, there was a teaser and then three episodes, I think. Three, or three missions episodes. Yeah, well, basically, with that one, I mean, if you think it was a, it was in the middle of the pandemic, it was a government body trying to get information out to children, mm. and after that, the conversation with us, it kind of, yes, the budget increased, but the scope of the entire project changed, didn't it? Because we said what you're producing here could be used nationwide. Absolutely no reason why you can't reach out to other schools all across the country which is what they did so they yeah that's value. well absolutely and it just it, it just proves what I just said before which is tell them if you've got a, a set budget or a budget in mind it doesn't doesn't harm it at all it's it's not a case of we're just trying to squeeze as much profit out of it as possible it is sort of tied in with what, well, what what it is not that this is kind of you know publicly available information to clients but there's as we all know there's many times when we've worked with a restrictive budget rather it's all restrictive relative to the scope of what's needed but we've made that judgment call it's like well you know th there's not going to be much left in the pot when it's done but it's the right thing for this right client at the right time and we'll do that and equally i was also thinking about the times that you know i get dirty looks off you and i'm on the phone and i'm telling people you've got how much oh no we can do it for less than that so sometimes that happens too. That yeah. looks off me. <laughs> 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 Somebody else in this room that gives dirty looks. 
Well, I mean, obviously, you know, clients have, they know what the, the video needs to return for them. <coughs> so th there's always a, an idea in the mind of, of what they can afford to spend and what the return is. So, um, yeah, so I think we've agreed it's definitely a good thing if clients are just open about the budget and yeah, the, that, that the, helps. The, the takeaway is w we are genuinely committed to giving them the best possible thing they can get for their budget. We're not we're not there to judge the budget. Obviously, if sometimes it is just too small to do anything reasonable with, and you have to have that conversation. But generally, it's just about we we are as invested in the success of it as they are. If it works for them, it works for us. So we're moving now into the kind of actual stages of production starting with pre-production how much does pre-production impact the actual cost of the client depends on the project doesn't it if there's a lot of moving parts you know locations to arrange casting to do um camera tests to do etc etc then it, as was the case on this recent tv advert where you probably put three weeks solid in the pre-production yeah that's all got to be accounted for but then there's many other projects where we might get the call at 9 a.m. and be working on it by 10 because it doesn't need that prep so it just depends on what what's actually needed and obviously the more complex the outcome and particularly when there's stuff to be filmed and locations and people and all the rest of it and crew to, to bring together and dates to be found it uh, just takes time and again that, that's probably tied in a little bit with locations which I think is probably one of the more obvious ones uh, to be truthful, I don't think many, uh, I'd have to check the numbers and see, but my hunch is that the percentage-wise, it's probably quite a low percentage of projects that we actually really charge any pre-production time on. Really? Well, I, was, I, I agree with you that there's there's definitely somewhere it's very, very short. Um, but I would say there's, there's by definition, there must be some pre-production on everything. Well, yeah, if you're writing a script and doing voiceover recordings, there's always something, but what I'm saying is the three week example there is not the norm no and with that one it was the, there was a lot of practical effect in that TV commercial so we had to do some tests to make sure they worked before we arrived to film on the day um, I think we had to film 17 different products so there was just a lot of sorting out and they had to be printed especially for the day so yeah that probably was a longer lead time than, than others were um, well, some Mark's some pre-production now and a fly more job is going to get shot next spring. Yeah, well, with that one, absolutely. <laughs> that one does need it need it needs a storyboard development. It needs an animatic. Um, it needs a lot. It just needs a lot. Of, it's just got to be right. Really, what it needs is good weather. <laughs> yeah, always. When, the, when when we're going to South Africa to film this, come on. Well, whatever. Twenty twenty three. Twenty twenty three. Might have to. Bad weather. Except I'm used to. Except the two days this week that you could have filmed it, it was the actually two glorious. days that yeah, it was glorious. the two days that I'd selected and uh, couldn't get out to film for mm. uh, for the reasons. But no, there is, like that pre-production for that particular one. There is like three D. There's three D elements. There's live action. There's animation within the like. That's the pre-production. Like figuring that out for the practical effects as well. Um, so the client come in and just asking for a video or you know whatever it is will not have probably considered any of that that goes into the pre-production I think there's a lot more to it than kind of what you've rattled off as well um, but yeah there's there's a lot to it and like you say we bring our years of experience knowing which, which aspects we need to in, involve in that yeah because I mean, even script writing you know that yeah. can take a long time even if it's a short, even if it's a 30 second commercial getting the script absolutely right and if you've got, if it's a TV commercial, you've obviously got clear cast tied up with, tied in with the pre-production process um, so I don't know what that camera's doing mm -hmm. I don't know if that beeped, I don't know if that's a good beep or bad beep, I don't know Am I oh, well, that definitely it definitely heard you I was say, it's like me throwing my voice there making a little sound Ryan's watching us from home <laughs> back on um, yeah, so even just the script, what other things will be involved in pre-production that we haven't mentioned so far? Location scouting could be one. Well, um, if it needs actors. Pretty common. 
Yeah, Caston. You said things we hadn't mentioned. I've already talked about both of them. Crew, oh, sorry, get the gathering crew. <laughs> yep, mentioned that. Have you really? Mm-hmm. I've got to listen more. <laughs> it's quite a good podcast. You should <laughs> <Yeah>. tune in. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, yeah, I'll catch it. I'll catch it in the edit. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, we talk about locations, casting, crew, tests, writing, locations, obviously, regularly included in that. Um, sometimes it's just research, I suppose. We haven't talked about that, but sometimes you just need to sit and read stuff, read up on things, learn a new technique, even. Sometimes that comes into it. Set builds. Yeah. More and more set builds. Production. The glitz, the glamour of production. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's become sentient. Right? <laughs> that camera is the star of this show now. That's the ge- that's it's this week's <laughs> guest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so production um again, I suppose there's a lot of obvious parts of this as to why what the production is is going to affect the cost. Including yeah. you know, how big's your camera? I remember I remember pitching against another <laughs> against a competitor and the client seemed obsessed with I'm giving this job to whoever's got the biggest camera. <laughs> <laughs> Did he really mean camera though? Is that your gut? I apologize. Bad, <laughs> bad, bad time for your stomach Chris to rumble. Yeah, no. <laughs> Just hurry up. Get, some McCoy's Chris. Let's get through these. I've got somewhere to be. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so open anyone. What you're filming, where you're filming it, how many people you need to film it, what weather conditions you need to film it. Is it indoor? Is it in a studio? The list goes on and on and on. Like, How big is your camera? Not how big, but definitely which camera you're going to use, whether it's a camera that you need to rent in, whether it's specialist equipment you need to rent in, all kinds of stuff. Mm-hmm. Post-production. Again lot of easy points to consider here yeah? so how long is it going to take how many editing days is it going to need does it need animation does it need graphics mm. it needs a sound mix does it need music um, the pulling together of the thing in post production is you know it's a really fun part but it's it, for some productions it can take a long time we produced a TV commercial this year with uh, CG Hippo that needed to be added into live action shots. Took a bit of time, didn't it, lads? It did. As, po- it as opposed to last summer when we were rattled off about four and four weeks that were all just pretty simple, straightforward, one day live action shoots and edits throughout the door a couple of days after we shot them. Yeah, the basic edit can actually be really quick to get together, to get a kind of rough pass <coughs> and get a feel for the flow of it. But once you start added, adding in the finesse into that, getting the sound kind of evened out, colour grading, um, all the effects and everything that has to go in. Plus, you've also, if it's TV, you've got the, the mastering side of it as well. Mm-hmm. Making sure it's, because it, it cause has to go to Clearcast for review and when it's finished, has to go to the broadcasters in a very specific format. I think that's it with the <coughs> that post-production that you've said there with the TV commercial coming together quite quickly, like a day or two like to get the edit down I think that but that's based on a lot of the work that's gone before that in the pre-production like yeah. nailing all those elements down making sure ev- everything's going to run like clockwork so when you do come to edit that commercial together based on the storyboard you've got it all in front of you you've got all those you've, you've done a lot of the work already before it's even in the edit unless of course there's a lot of post-production graphics that you've got to do like you've said I always get a little bit confused of like, if we're just doing an animation, solely an animation, is that classed as production or post production? Because you refer to animation there as post production. Mm-hmm. Actually, if it's just purely an animation, that is the production. So then the post, then there is not as much in the post production because it's just your audio that you're doing. Does that make sense? So yeah. there, there is a little bit of a kind of <coughs> a balancing act sometimes depending on again what the project is, what we're creating if it is video, video and animation or just animation mm-hmm. um, Well the, the post-production is it's a bit of a playground as well isn't it 
because even with the plan you've got in place there's still scope to make more improvements and people still kind of suggest ideas I've just uh, looked at my phone there and seen some comments on a, an edit that we've got out for a review at the moment and the client's full of ideas and come and try this and come and try that and to be fair quite often that's where you do just find little bits of magic little extra things that you can add mm-hmm. bits of finesse that just push it even further so that's definitely my favorite part of the post-production side where everything comes together and that's when you start getting the great reactions in there from obviously yeah. the team the client i think that's it one thing we haven't mentioned there about the post-production is that there's passes several passes as well so it's not just post-production isn't just delivering the aim is to deliver the final product to the client but there is passes where you can see the quality improves like you know the rough edit the audio mix then down more attention to detail a color pass um grading obviously of the footage there for the color pass mm-hmm. um so it, it builds up layers and it just improves as you go on. i'm gonna give a plug to uh frame.io because that's the platform we use to um show clients edit as we're going mm-hmm. um, and the platform allows them to add comments and kind of draw on the footage everything um, so that's a really great tool, isn't it? To let the client actually have their input on on the work as it yeah, progresses. It's, it's been so beneficial for us and the and the clients really. And the feature where you can side by side review version one against version two or version six to see like the progress as well. I think that's that's a great feature. And I believe the guys that invented it, it was bought out by Adobe, wasn't it? So I hope that they've been handsomely rewarded couple for all pre- that good work. Couple of pretty pennies each. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Well do, you done. do you remember how we started using Frame? I don't actually. Oh, well, really? Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> it's contagious. <laughs> well, well done, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Where's your feedback? <laughs> I'll send you the odd frame as well. <laughs> so I think we're going to rattle through these next few together because these are all kind of. Um, external costs if I'm being very cold and calculating about it on the budget sheet so we're looking at the people that need paid to be in your video so that would include actors models and presenters if there's a voiceover on it as well voiceover artist needs to be paid they do great work to speak of people that get uh, handsomely rewarded for what they do okay. if you've got a good voice I highly recommend becoming a voiceover artist because uh, you'll be rich and never have to leave you Back bedroom, will you, Matthew? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's specifically only allowed to set up a vote booth in a back bedroom. That's right, yeah. Um, so the next one, music and sound design. Okay, so sound design you're definitely going to need in your video. That's just, uh, you know, you can have it be, be quite a basic one where it's just a basic sound mix so everything is nice and level and it sounds nice and crisp. Music, quite often, I think, is that there's not many videos we make that don't have music in I can off the top of my head I can only think of one type of video because we have made it for a few different clients but yeah only one that doesn't have any music on it Mm -hmm. so music obviously you're going to have to pay for that what options have people got music wise lots of ready available stock music um, which is obviously the cheapest option in and um, how does that work then because we get asked that question quite a lot because I think people when they hear stock music they think corporate cheesy crap but it isn't is it no it's there's, not there's, all. There's, there's so much out there yeah, yeah there's a lot of <coughs> great work out there great mood great you know adds to the production value um, and reasonably priced as well but the time comes from trying to find that perfect track or your edit I mean it's not just a case of there it is in front of you you've got, to, you've got to find it and then what if the client doesn't like it or somebody in in the client's circle of friends doesn't like it mm. Mm. Um, yeah Mark you're on a bit of pain there bit of, bit of pain <laughs> um, but yeah you know that's that's an option uh, the other option is getting something obviously bespoke especially written for for that edit um, but then 
it comes with a price tag doesn't it it does it obviously it's a lot more expensive than the stock music option um, however you get absolutely fantastic results don't you you've got something bespoke it's created specifically for what you're doing and it's not just that it's the ex exclusivity of it isn't it because clearly everyone on the team is good at picking music because it's very rare that a client says no to a proposed track these days it used to be more common but it's pretty rare now but um, there's many times that I see television adverts particularly on American TV maybe three four six months after we've used a bit of music and then it's on that advert that's not a problem but if you want to totally make sure that you know protect yourself from that basically you go bespoke don't you you want it well yeah conversely I think it was only a couple of weeks ago one of our clients said oh I heard my music track <laughs> on a and it was a big I can't remember the brand but it was a big brand commercial but they were quite happy about that hmm. it's because ours had we used it first you know mm -hmm. and they were quite happy about that so anyway music obviously has a cost as well and there's a there's some good options anyway in terms of I suppose there's a third option as well it's actually buying the rights to a Piece of oh music yeah, of course, yeah, play, yeah. You know, um, there'll be. A tr a tr I think we've recently had that with a client, haven't we? They've mm -hmm. gone through a process of trying to figure out a song that they like and how much that might cost them. Um, but that's down to kind of the number of times it'll be played, isn't it? Think, well, can you quickly it? explain if, if so? If you want to use a, a famous music track in your video, it comes with a, a price tag. How how do people find out what that is? Because it's mm. it's it's fairly it's not complex, but it's n it's not easy is that either. Another podcast? <laughs> no, God, it's definitely no. another podcast. Pe you want people to like stay awake. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, not necessarily. There's a big market in helping people get <laughs> sleep actually. And if we're helping you do that, then do I need to get really low and whisper? The no, no sleep, Matthew. Not uh, uh, make enough. sweet love. Fair enough. <laughs> um, well. It is complex, and there isn't. There's not just one source you can go to because, depending on what the music is, you have to figure out who owns the music rights, the recording rights, but also who owns the publishing rights. So sometimes that's c controlled by the same company, but not necessarily. So you've got to, you know, make inquiries on that. There's quite often a bit of research that needs to go into that. Sometimes the, who wrote the song becomes an issue as well. And um, then you've got the same questions that you normally have to deal with, which is, well, how is it going to be used? Where is it going to be used? What's it going to be used on? Particularly when it's a known song. There's obviously lots of famous examples of musicians refusing permission, even though the deal's maybe been done by the record company and there's millions of dollars sat on the table. They still say no because they don't want to be associated with a brand or whatever. Um, and then there is kind of there's a side option from it as well, which is you can also at a much lower cost commission someone to kind of recreate that music and sing their own version of it so um, not to say that John Lewis have cut any corners with their budgets but the, the way that they have been reinterpreting classic music and having it you know basically all re reproduced in a, in a style that they kind of have made their own um, that will be cheaper for them than just using the original track they love a depressing acoustic version the day, of, a, yeah. of a popular the day, track yeah. don't they um, well, should we say how much Leo, Leo Sia wanted for, for that track? What if was you can the, remember, what was I can't it? remember. Which track was it again? You Make Me Feel Like Dancing? Feel Like Dancing, that's the one. Um, which I did a test sheep dancing to it. Um, yeah, was it not... Um, <laughs> Link in comments. <laughs> <laughs> no, that got binned. That got binned. No, it's still on, on YouTube. Is it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the concept got binned anyway, so as good as. So how much was it then, to license that track from? I think it was. Um, I think for I can't remember which one it was. The composer. I feel like it was a minimum of thirty, but somewhere between thirty and fifty. I can't remember. Thirty and fifty thousand. Yeah. I'd say it with the respect it deserves, eh? <laughs> um, okay, Mason. <laughs> yeah, so expensive. But then, then you might hit on one. Well, one artist might say, "Yeah, you can have it for." Well, like it's all relevant, isn't it? Because you're saying it's expensive, but that was for a local TV campaign. 
if it was for a national ad, it would have been, you know, multiples of that. Mm -hmm. And it's it's only expensive relative to the overall concept and budget, isn't it? Yeah, and and I, and I think and certainly if a client goes into it thinking I have to have a known bit of music, then you can have that conversation up front. You can tell them what it's going to be, and I think unlike in the past when let's to, to use an obvious example you know you'd cut something together for a, a council or a little charity and they'd say oh yeah can you just throw um, M people what have you done today to make me feel proud on there and you're like well that's not really how it works no you can't do that um, but that, that doesn't really happen anymore I think generally if people to be fair to them they did understand it was going to cost them big money more more money than it would cost to actually produce the advert mm -hmm. but that's that's for them to weigh up and decide if it's worth the spend isn't it well, yeah, there's quite a few TV commercials where when people recall it, they're referencing the music. Yeah. So, you know, we're not saying that um, the music's not worth it at all because it can be the kind of the cornerstone corner of the, the entire yeah. endeavour. So, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so that's music covered, I think, now. So moving on to the last one, which is just different languages. We speak English, but does your target audience, or does it need to go into multiple countries? Um, obviously, that would come with a cost as well for the trans. The translation itself has a cost. Is it going to be dubbed with a different language? Um, and it, which one is it? It's German, isn't it? So if you make a forty-second video, and it's in English, mm. and this and the client says, right, we need that in six other languages. Right, fine. We'll get the translation stone. We'll get the few people to do that. Um, they'll all come back, and they'll all be, you know, on average around forty seconds. You know, French might be thirty-nine, um, Dutch might be thirty-seven, German minute and thirty. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's obviously some work to do with different languages if if that's what you need to do, and captions and subtitles as well, which is uh, coming up more and more because I think everyone needs to make more of an effort to make basically all video content accessible yeah. to, to people that can't hear it so and there's a lot of great tools out there to kind of almost completely automate it um i think there's been a big shift hasn't they quite recently in that in that area yeah well a lot of it's to do with obviously software being able to listen and pretty much do it automatically but and with hint god We've got a story as well about uh, YouTube <laughs> automatically gener automatically generated subtitles for some Are you videos. Put a link to that. No, video? not in this one. I no, I no. couldn't. It's but it was. A, let's just say it was a, a a brand that is known globally and has quite a big. Um, am I going too too close to the bone there? You're giving us the eyes. I think you were going to say it has quite a big presence in the northeast. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, that's fine. That's, that's fine. fine. Okay. Um, yeah, and produced some videos for them, which they were very happy with. By the way, they were really good. And it was maybe a couple of weeks after the project was finished and delivered that we got a, a frantic call from the client saying, "Who the hell wrote these subtitles on YouTube?" And we said, "Well, nobody." If you, obviously we'd given them the video files they had uploaded the video files to their YouTube channel YouTube did its thing which is right I'm going to listen to this and if you don't give me a, a subtitle file to put on I'm just going to listen and generate me on and some of the shit it was saying in that subtitle file was unbelievable uh, literal foul language it was like <laughs> it was like the exorcist had taken over the the, the the people featured and it was just swear word after swear word this is they had thought they thought someone had written a subtitle file and, and put it up there to kind of but no um, it was you know it's funny though wasn't it yeah we got a few laughs <laughs> once it was fixed we got a few laughs <laughs> yeah so that concludes this content, lads. Um, this piece of content. This, pe this, <laughs> <laughs> this unit of content. <laughs> uh, yeah, this trailer module is complete. <laughs> Put down your pens. You can now officially price up a video project for yeah. all your friends. 
I so to summarise what what we what we're saying here. Yeah, I was just about to ask you oh. to do that, Mark. Go on. No, no, no. I've asked you. <laughs> <laughs> that was the question he's been worried about asking yeah. you. <laughs> well, so we've we've covered in this podcast how much does video production cost? I'm not going to read through the bullet points because that's just bloody no, boring. I don't want you to do that. We summarised it up front. Let's be honest. We said there isn't a, a standard answer. It depends what you need, how we go about making it. But the important thing is have an open and honest conversation about what you need to achieve and what resources you've got because we'll do we'll, we'll create the best possible output for you mm-hmm. yeah. it's basically what he's saying is just tells your budget and it'll be fine what i'm saying is if you can afford a fiat panda we'll get you a great we'll make you a great fiat panda and if you can afford a beautiful mercedes we'll make you a beautiful mercedes do they still make the Fiat? Fiat cannot be st- making pandas still. Mm, I don't know. They make little, what do they call it? Fiat 500? Is that like the, oh, yeah. the, oh, the success yeah. out of the panda? Yeah, yeah. It's very successful. Like micro machines all over the place, those <laughs> things. <laughs> they look like you could pick them up and just turn them around and move them. Well, I reckon if we've got every, everyone from the office. I if we ever see one, they can't. size my hands, to be honest, but fair enough, yeah. If everyone, if everyone in the office got involved, yeah. <laughs> You've been very careful with your hands on this podcast. You have. You haven't banged them on the table. I haven't noticed them, so that's good. Try, Whatever try, you do, I'm keep trying doing to cultivate a gentle touch. You know? <laughs> yeah, I forgot. If Velvet we're, Glove. That's what they call me. Velvet <laughs> Glove Newman. If we ever see a Fiat 500 in the car park, if we get all the team down, I reckon we could tip it like a cow. It. I th- <laughs> no, it'd be that, funnier to just move it to a different space. <laughs> <laughs> I think there is one in the car park. I think right. Okay. One. So we've got that. But is it not more. Tom? <laughs> <laughs> might be yeah I don't know I park in the VIP section you know yeah. so don't you're behind the, you're behind the rope aren't you <laughs> <laughs> so yeah thank you for listening thank you for watching the podcast um, however you're taking this in it would appreciate if you <laughs> like it share it subscribe to it tell your friends tell your gran tell your mothers yep. or if you have any other questions because we're not going to stop <laughs> <laughs> no matter how much we're you want us to, we're not going to so stop. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.